Good morning. Being here, it's early for those of us who have been here all weekend and lots of uh, frolicking with cocktails. So um, I'm just going to have the playwrights introduce themselves and their plays first. If you could do that. My name is Rajiv Joseph, and uh, my play Mr. Wolf had its reading yesterday. Uh, I'm Eli Clark. Uh, my play was Future Thinking. Pick, pick a mic. <laughs> oh, my name is Adam Rapp, and I wrote The Purple Lights of Joppa, Illinois. I'm Rachel Vons, and I wrote Five Mile Lake, which is on this set. Now, I know Eli just said, oh, people always want to know why. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you guys why. Uh, where, did these, where did these plays come from? What, were the, what was the seed of these plays? Why you wrote them? What was, was there an image, thought, a person, a story that kind of inspired you to write these plays? Do you want to start? I'll start. Um, I, there was a, a horror movie called The Orphanage, um, which Ooh. is a, uh, a kind of supernatural movie about this woman who loses her son. And uh, it's a really spooky, cre creepy movie. But there's a, just a one little tiny scene in it where she and her husband, who are slowly becoming estranged as a result of the stress of losing their son who just disappeared, um, that they're in a kind of support group uh, for, for parents who have lost their children, who have, who have children who have either been abducted or have just gone missing. And, the, and it was just this tiny little one-off scene, but there was something about that scene that, that ma made me start thinking about the parents of abducted children and how the stress of that might, um, might tear a relationship apart and, you know, and, and who are these other people in this group and how, how like, the, you know, sh sharing a, a terrible kind of experience is something that can also bond people together. Um. I uh, I am pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I don't have to answer anything. Um, uh, and so I I'm I've been thinking about children and parents, and um, I think that's one of the reasons why, or at least I hope, in my play, uh, you end up sort of feeling for for both sides of that coin. Um, the parent-child coin. Uh, as I was just really thinking about like what we what we um, what we want from our children and what we feel we deserve and what we are owed from them and uh, vice versa. Um, and also, I was a child actor, so that's there's that too. Wow, great. <laughs> My parents were fabulous, but uh, we knew. <laughs> We are they in the audience? They're not. But they, um, they're they're really wonderful, and they were nothing like the parents in that play. But they, um, <laughs> but I knew a lot of kids like that, so I was interested in, in that. Um, I had been writing a lot of like kind of bigger plays, and I wanted to write something small and intimate. And I was actually when I spoke to Mark Masterson about this commission, I was going to write this bigger, another bigger play that was set in like 1928 and then also in 2008 in the same space. And it was complicated. And I'm still going to write that play, but I kept getting haunted by this idea of um, this father-daughter lost time relationship. And um, just it's more personal than that. Like my, my father suffers from mental illness and we don't have a relationship. So in some ways writing the play was like a wish to have a conversation. Um, and then it became a lot of other things, but that was sort of the door I walked through when I, when I started writing it. Um, for me, I think because I've been thinking a lot about ambition lately and my ambition and the consequences of it, um, I increasingly more and more get to spend less time with my family. So I, I don't know, I've just been thinking a lot about uh, the pull home and when I get there and the time that we spend together and how I always feel like I want to leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> not always, but you know, you. I, I, I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, I also was on a writer's retreat at this lake house, and so that sort of, the image of that and the sounds of that place also sort of spurned the play. Interesting. Wow, we could be here for hours. Just. <laughs> um, so 
Since some of you write for television and film, how, and there's a lot, always a concern, why come back to theater? Why come back to write these plays? I can answer that right now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was actually uh, producing my episode this, this week and last week of the show that I write for on television. And it's which really, is what? which is called Extant. Um, it's going to be on CBS this summer starring Halle Berry. And I think it's going to be great. Um, and it's wonderful. It's, it's, so, it's really fun to work, write for television. But So I was doing that and then coming here for the weekend um, to rehearse. And the experience is so different and so, and, and with all respect to my television show, which I'm very excited about, it's just so much more, this experience is so much more rich and creative and collaborative um, because there's no time in TV and it's like you just have 30 seconds to rehearse it and it has to happen and often you can't you know, get the scene right in front of you, you just have to sort of put it together in editing and it's just a totally different ball game and to be in a room with actors for six hours and a director in conversation about work is like, it's amazing. And my husband was like, you're so much like lighter and great this week. <laughs> you, seem, you seem so happy. <laughs> Anyone else want to answer that? Adam, do you feel? Uh, well, I've, I've made three films. As, uh, I'm a, a, a director of them, and I've worked on a couple of television shows. And we, I also have a show that's, uh, that I'm on that shoots in New York right now um, called Flesh and Bone that's going to be on Stars. And um, I think the thing that I love so much is that, you know, you get in a room with actors when you're in the theater, and it's just you and them, and then sometimes the dramaturg will be there, and sometimes the artistic director comes in and watches a, a run-through and gives you notes. And there's not this whole apparatus or machine that is um, a studio, executives with job descriptions who feel like they have to talk all the time. Um, <laughs> and it's just you making work. It's like a very homemade, uh, f almost a folk kind of activity. It's like... And it's a live event that's witnessed by people alive in a room with you. And so in a lot of ways, the stakes are just higher. It's a greater high-wire act. And I think there's a, a greater cleansing because of it. And I think people uh, appreciate the risk of that. And I think our culture right now is really hungry for real stuff happening because we're so connected to our phones and our iPads. And we're in this mode like this all the time. And so I think the theater is becoming this really interesting place where you can actually go see something happening right there. And so I'm finding that I'm craving that more right now. And, and also there's much more politics because there's much more money involved in TV and film. And there's so little money involved in theater that I think it's all about the human experience. And so every time I do TV and film, I cannot wait to get in a room with actors again. It's as simple as that. Rajit, do you I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think I could uh, ex, you know, articulate it as well as these two just did. Mm -hmm. I, I would just second everything they just said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And do you feel like, is there a higher calling to being a playwright than being a t uh, any kind of, of a other writer? Would you say that your responsibility as a playwright is different than writing for any other medium? I, I wouldn't, I, I think it's dangerous to get into a higher calling. I'm using that in quotes. I know, but I mean, I think, <laughs> I think it's interesting that you say that because, um, you know, uh, Teresa Rebeck has, we, she and I have talked about this a lot. She was my mentor when I first started writing, and we're still friends. And she was here this week, and and, um, and I think we all agree that like we love theater and we and we love being playwrights and everything that you know Adam mm -hmm. um, and Elijah just said is is all true. And then, but the 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 pitfall for me in, in terms of like thinking about it as a higher form or a higher calling is that then then you get into things of like when I'm not doing that, am I am I selling out? Mm -hmm. And I think selling out is like a self destructive notion. You know, because you know we all want to make a living, and we all we all want to find you know different ways to express ourselves creatively, and you can do that through television and and t and movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so and and so you shouldn't feel. I think it it puts too much of a, a pressure on theater to think of it as this uh, this holy form, mm -hmm. because it is. But so is TV, and uh, and and there's just different, as you said, politics involved in it. And uh, and and I I just I think that's an like it, it's it's it's. I can see why you, one would think that, in, in part because of you know the, the the cleansing power of it that you know that Adam talked about. But uh, I guess I personally think it's like it's it's a it's a dangerous little pitfall. Well, and television, when it's great, offers you th something that both film and 
theater can't, which is an ongoing story mm -hmm. that can last years and years. So, you know, you can take a character from one place to a very distant place and you can kill them and then the story can keep going. <laughs> like, um, uh, yeah. I mean, and you can't always kill good. people always in the theater. Always a good thing. You, can. you can't. Mm -hmm. That's a rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a playwriting rule. Um, <laughs> but uh, to me, I mean, I just write, for me personally, it feels like it feeds my soul in a different way. But also part of that is that it's not my television show. I've never worked on my own, you know, it's, I haven't mm -hmm. had my own created by me television show. So you're working with, you're working on someone else's vision. And I've been really lucky to work with people who I really love and think are incredible, who have great vision. But it's, you know, it's, you're mm -hmm. supporting that work. And so, you know, it feels like a higher calling while you're working on your own thing. Yeah. But that's narcissism. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Rachel? What about you and your, at this point in your career in terms of writing plays? Does it? I, I mean, I don't write for TV. I know, but so. you <laughs> um, do I think it's a? What's do you feel like the sta the pl stories you ha you tell in theater are different than you might tell in some other medium? Sure. Um, I mean, uh, with television, again, there is this um, this a different kind of engine underneath it. You're you're watching something that has to carry across, you know, whatever twelve episodes. That so that you're watching something that um, is very quickly pieced, a piece mm -hmm. of a story, and, and when I'm writing a play, it's very much, well, this has to fit, everything has to fit in this one mm -hmm. piece. Um, so it's just a different, a muscle, it's a different muscle. And are you, when do you guys think about the audience? Five seconds before mm -hmm. the show the starts, show. <laughs> and I go, and th what happened to me on Friday was I go, I, I never realized how much I swear in my plays until I'm <laughs> sitting with... 400 people going like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> So then, that's when I think about it. What about you, Adam? Do you think about the audience as you're writing a play? Uh, yeah, I do, because there's plays where there, there's a really strong fourth wall where the actors aren't supposed to know the audience is there, and then there's there are plays where I, you know, they're interacting with the audience as if the audience is um, abstractly representing something in the world of the play. So yeah, I think about that a lot. I think about I think I think one of the things to, not to jump back to the last no, question, but it, it involves audience is I think that theater is so much about tension and how much tension can you sustain and make an audience forget that they're there. And the the art of TV writing is is an art of entertainment. You know, you want them to stay in their living room and maybe not get a snack. <laughs> Whereas in the theater, you just you just want them to forget where they park their car and and completely dive into the world of the of the play. There's also something that is interesting, I think, because now that I've been writing for TV a little bit, when you when you write for TV, you're basically giving up your copyright as an artist. You, you're, they're buying your copyright. So you're writing for a corporation. Um, and when we're writing plays, we still own our copyright. When we write fiction, we still own our copyright. So it is about our soul in that way. So I agree with that so much about. But with premium cable now, there are no, there are no commercial interruptions. So you're not dealing with Doritos and pantyhose and those kinds of things every 12 <laughs> minutes. So you, as, a, as a crafts person uh, uh, who writes, uh, we're all dramatists, you, you can do, you can actually write drama. You can do 52 minutes of something without interruption so you can create that world of tension that we all strive to do in the theater. So it is changing and the landscape of writing for TV is changing and that's why you're seeing, I think, so many talented playwrights and novelists and other kinds of writers, journalists, who are writing for TV now. And um, I think there is some really beautiful work being done. And then, of course, there's still a lot of Doritos commercials and <laughs> things like that that are still kind of holding down the, the lower levels of it. But um, I, I think it's all about tension, and, if it, it, and I think that's our training in the theater. And if we can do that on TV and make people sit in their chair and not go to the bathroom, then we've achieved something. You know? Well, some people might be scared by that for the field. What do you guys think? That, that we will lose these writers for television and they won't come back. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, and I think, I think particularly because of what Adam just said about, you know, the, the way that TV is changing in terms of not just premium cable, but the way it's being digested, you know, through, like, devices rather than, like, um, like a TV guide. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the, the storytelling is, is becoming, like, 
it's not it's not this all across the board, but there's these there's these shows that you can that you can write for that I have. You know, I wrote for Nurse Jackie on Showtime, which has ten episodes. Two years, and it didn't it didn't have any effect at all on my playwriting output. You know, I was still able to work on my plays. I was still able to go to things like PPF or you know what have you festivals and and be a part of the theater community. And I think that you know you you there's so many playwrights here this week who have worked in television, and I don't think it you know, has adversely affected their, their, their participation in the world of theater, and it doesn't have to. I think that it, when, it was, when it used to be like it was network TV only, then you're, you have to move to L.A. and you have to like give yourself over to these 27 episodes in a season, and it's soul-crushing, and, 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 and it's in the service of a corporation. It's not like that so much anymore. You, don't, you, you have other choices. Great. Anyone else on that subject? I mean, I, I moved to L.A., four and a half years ago and um, sort of really didn't write plays for a while because it was it was all consuming to learn how to write TV. I mean, I got a job on a show um, called Rubicon that was on AMC um, without having ever written an episode of television. I mean, they, they um, read my play and so I had never written for television. It was so hard to learn how to write a scene in a page um, that hmm. wasn't like a play scene in a page. You know, like you can write a th scene for the theater in a page that's like abstract and weird and like whatever, but to Don't write... let the director figure it out. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but to write, to write a scene that contains all of the things that a 20-page scene hmm. would have to contain, um, it was really hard. And so then for me, going back to theater was also hard because um, I'd write a two-page scene and be like, well, that's a great scene. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this play should have 700 scenes or whatever. Um, but, but, you know, so, and, but I was also really young when I mm -hmm. came here, and so it took me a little while to get, this is the first play I've written in a while. Um, uh, but now that I've done it, it's like, I, this whole weekend I was like, I'm going to write every day. I'm just going <laughs> to write for theater. Um, so I hope I do that. <laughs> Do you feel like these plays that we saw this weekend speak to uh, this era in 2014? Do you think they speak to where we are at this moment? And in what ways would you, if you think about your plays as being part of a movement of theater, where do these plays fit in this 2014? Hmm. Well, I, I think these plays were really well programmed to work together. I mean, they, I, I really felt like they were all kind of in conversation with one another. Um, I, I don't really know how to like, how to ex express why I feel that way, but I, you know, some people were like, there's a lot of dead babies in these plays. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I was like, not in mine. And they were like, bone cancer, <laughs> two year old. <laughs> like, oh, sorry. Um, but I think that they, uh, I don't know, there was just a really interesting um, parent-child thing going on this weekend and um, surrogate parents and, and um, people who, uh, I don't know, I mean, I found Rajiv's play so, I, I mean, I, I don't know, you didn't get to see my play, but I yeah. really, I felt like, I was like, oh my God, like, this is, it's so, we you know, in my play you have a man who is meeting the, um, the object of his affection and desire, and um, is she's like an oracle for him. And I feel like that, you know, that's <laughs> happening in your play. And um, right. and you know, it, she then kind of transforms him into a parent for her in some way, and then like a sexual object for a moment. And I don't know, it just was really um, it was really, and I felt like that was true when I was watching your guys' plays too. It was like it was a really interesting. Um, I just felt like it was really well done by the <laughs> by the SCR. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what do you guys think? I mean, I think a lot of these plays. I know mine is is a lot about questioning what home is and people, um, you know, leaving where they're from and and. I, th I think a lot of uh, these plays were dealing with people questioning their decisions, you know, getting to a place and then suddenly turning back and thinking, oh, maybe I have been on the wrong path this whole time. 
Um, and I think that was a theme that was carrying over a lot. Very American theme. I felt like there was a lot of longing in, your, in these plays. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. a need to connect, at least. Yes. When I saw two plays yesterday. I saw mm -hmm. both of your plays, which, which were wonderful. And I think, you know, it, to an, in thinking about it the way you're, you're questioning it now, it's like in both there's, there's a man who is desperately trying to connect with a, a, a girl or a woman, mm -hmm. and uh, and that is and that that drives mm -hmm. so much of it, and and in, in both cases, you know, kind of it hooks the audience into this mm -hmm. into this journey, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, you know I don't know it's it, it's true it's like uh, the 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 awesome thing about a festival like this is that is you're <laughs> you're overwhelmed with stories, you know. You know that there's like three three plays readings or pl productions in a day, mm -hmm. and at the end you're just like it's all just like um, they they kind of fit together, mm -hmm. which is a cool way of, of, of absorbing you know stories. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been thinking a lot about how many <coughs> ways there are to get story now. I mean, there are a thousand ways you can access to a story through the radio, through the internet, through the movies. Through the how do we keep people coming into the theater for these stories? Like, what is it? Do you guys worry about that, or is that not something, as playwrights, that you spend a lot of time thinking about, about how, what audiences you're going to bring into your plays, or how you're going to get them in for your stories when there are so many things competing for people's attention now? Uh, I don't know. It's There's, a big question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, though, because I think what's happening is because of devices and because of digital media and because of the analog world sort of falling away to the digital world and all that, I feel like theater or the live experience, whether it's circus performance or theater or going to see somebody sing at a cafe, it's becoming, it's, it's becoming exoticized in a weird way. And I feel like what's going to happen at some point, I hope this happens to keep the theater alive, is that another youth culture will be like, put your iPads down and let's go see let's go see an Arthur Miller play or, <laughs> or an Eli Clark play, you know? I'd I think it's... Say Eli Clark. Radical. Yeah, yeah. It'll be radical. Or, you know, w one of our plays will be happening in a, in a ramshackle garage <laughs> and it'll become part of, like, an underground movement and then suddenly live performance, which has survived for a billion years, uh, uh, will come back in a, in a really exciting way. And, I, you know, that's what you hope for. I mean, I've been around for a long time. I've written over 35 plays. I've written 11 novels. And I can tell you, like, you see these waves, and I've only, you know, been in the professional theater for, what, 15, 18 years or something like that, but you do see waves of, of young people c coming back in New York City and, and uh, hopefully in other parts of the country. Um, the thing that happened a few years ago that was really interesting is the, in, in New York, the opera of all places suddenly had this wave of young people who were getting, like, $15, $20 tickets and going to the opera, which is a really static event. Mm -hmm. Like, you go to the opera, and you see two people on stage in this large proscenium space, and they're singing in a very static way, and they're singing in often in a foreign language that, they can't, that we can't understand, but kids were craving that. And all these kids were, sh were showing up at Lincoln Center, and, like, two or 300 at a time are going, and I'm like, well, they, we need to figure out how to get them to the theater. Yeah. Yeah. We need to figure out how to make that exciting again for them so they're not, not thinking that... It's all corsets and you know people holding spears, mm -hmm. you know, because that's how that's theater education tells us that. And right. I think we should, you know, that's the mm -hmm. hope. That's the hope that they get excited for live experience and, you know, for the possibility of touching somebody, mm -hmm. you know, uh, beyond the fire code. You know. Anyone else want to comment on that? Well, I really think about when I'm writing a play. Like, is this a play for the theater? Or is this a play for the for a screen? Um, and I think that. That, at least for me, that, that question makes me not worry so much about, you know, if I'm writing a play that I feel like belongs on a stage and needs, a, needs the experience of a live audience, then I hope that that live audience will feel that need too. Um, and I, I think that my writing is sort of cinematic any, you know, anyway. It's usually structured pretty linearly and um, uh, I like plotting and you know but I um, but I try to I try at least to have it be something that you will want to experience live um, and then I'm just like listen then it's on you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, do you look I mean, like you're, you're I am I mean over I, that I found what Adam said really inspiring and mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's uh, 
it's it's a wonderful like I, that'd be wonderful you know like <laughs> if, if 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 that happened and <clears throat> but I think it's like it's true is that like um, I think people are always saying that theater is dying and 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 that's like it's Forever. just it's just what it is and it, it is always dying and it never dies you know and uh, and uh, and so it's um, and I think part of that is because like you say like it the storytelling is is unique unto itself like that nothing can take its place um, you can the, there, there can be other forms of entertainment that are you know that, that take up people's time and energies but nothing can take its place and um, and I, and I just I personally feel like it's just it's just a natural thing to uh, to, to be drawn towards you know and I you know I'm I'm not really I wasn't a theater person growing up I didn't go to the theater very often. I hadn't really even seen, I'd seen musicals, but I hadn't really seen a straight play um, until, I'm, until I was about 28, you know? And, uh, and, uh, and, and I, was go I, was w I went to grad school to do screenwriting, and I, but I was at NYU and we got a lot of tickets to, 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 to plays, and, and we saw them and we, we got to meet playwrights, and, and, and all of a sudden it started to open up and it just opened up naturally. It was just like, oh, well this is great, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and 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 it's it's alive and well you know there and here and so it's it's clearly a uh, an art form that is um, that keeps on kicking. I mean I, I don't know how to say it, but it's it's um it's the cat of yeah. art forms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it a, it's like a virus. <laughs> yeah. It will never go away. It dies. Yeah. Well, how that's a good question actually. How old were all of you when the first time you saw a, a play that you remember? first play that, we were talking about this at dinner last night actually, the first play that you remember being, oh, that's, that's, that's something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I talked about this last week at this dinner event, but uh, my sister was in the Pirates of Penzance in sixth grade, and I was in second grade, and um, I don't know why, but it made an enormous impression on me, partly because I was seeing my sister, someone I knew. Um, and my plays are nothing like the Pirates of Benzia. <laughs> As they're like the farthest thing from it, but um, that was the first moment where I was like, oh, I just want to be in this weird room with these weird people running around and the rest of us in the dark. It was, it was a, a big moment. Yeah. How about you, Adam? Um, well, my little brother is an actor, um, and he was doing musicals at a very young age, at, which I hated, because um, I was always hearing you're a good man, Charlie Brown, or Oliver, or and you know some of those are beautiful musicals, but I, I just, it was just because it was in my bedroom, and I was hearing him singing them all the time. They it was like eating too much pasta or something, and so I, I think when I first finally saw that like a straight play was could be a, an incredible thing. I was, a not, I was just writing fiction and I just, uh, I was early in college and I came home and uh, I was probably 20 um, and he was in John Guare's Landscape of the Body, which I think is, uh, I told this story the other night at a donor event, but it's, it's a true story. <laughs> it's a um, true story. It's a true story. And he was in this beautiful play, maybe my favorite play by John Guare, and, um, which is this haunting story of a mother, son, a uh, single mother raising her son in the West Village during a very violent time in, in New York City in the 70s when a lot of people are getting murdered and a lot of people are disappearing. And her sister, I think, is murdered. And he gets involved with this group of kids that are going around and knocking people on the head with wrenches and, and stealing things from their apartments. And he was playing a 14-year-old kid. And at one point, um, this is kind of a sidestep to the story, but at one point, my brother's character's head is cut off. And one of his friends is pushing the head around in a shopping cart and the, it hit a bump on the stage, and it was at the Goodman Theater in Chicago, which had this huge orchestra pit. And his head jumped out of the shopping cart and rolled uh, down the stage and fell into the orchestra pit. <laughs> and um, th literally, there was something about that accident, that live <laughs> accident, and also the play that just shook me. And I was like, wow, this is, was just witnessed by all these people. <laughs> and is my brother's head in the orchestra pit? And all that all that alchemy was so powerful to me that I was like, I, I want to try this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Um, I saw The Secret Garden when I was six, <laughs> and then um, 
And then almost right after that, I was cast as the lead in an off-Broadway musical. Um, <laughs> and Which was what? what? Which was called Opal. Um, it was at the Lambs Theater in New York. And uh, I'd never sung before. I mean, I was six. Um, I'd never sung before. I had, like, three solos. And um, I was on stage for two hours straight. I was the only kid in the show. And it was just... Now, I, mean, I grew up in the theater because of that. I mean, I did Les Mis after that. And um, the the experience of just, like, of being um, on the stage really just cracked open a world for me. Um, and I also, I did, I did Les Mis in New York, and I also did it on the tour. And the tour for me was, like, I mean, I was eight, and it was, like, this is a family and we are we are these like traveling group of weirdos <laughs> who like sing for people we don't know, and um, it just it was really magical. But then it wasn't really until um, high school when I had had at that point kind of stopped acting professionally, and um, did and but was like acting in high school plays and did and played Stella in Streetcar Named Desire. <laughs> And it was the first time I'd ever, like... In high school. In high school. <laughs> um, and uh, it was the first time I'd ever really acted. Because, you know, child acting is so much about being, um, like, knowing how to remember your lines and acting natural. I mean, it's really about... And that's still my acting style, if you were ever to see me act. It's like, I can play me or, like, variations on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I'm really good at that. <laughs> uh, and so, and, but it was the first time I was like, you know, not anything not like the person. And I was really trying to get inside of it. And I was like, this is, this is incredible. Like, this is an incredible experience that's transformative. And, um, and I remember that the girl and I, the girl who was playing Blanche and I went up on our lines, like, and wrote a scene in Street Carnage Desire. <laughs> like, uh, just did a 20-minute improv. <laughs> and it was, like, amazing. It was, I mean, it was probably terrible. But it was, a, it was so... Um, it was so... I don't know. It was so scary. It was, like, mm. nauseating and dizzying and terrifying and exhilarating mm. all at once. Um, like so, opening a play. For yeah. sure, for sure. And then, you know, and then after that, it was like, I'm going to write a lot of plays about, like, AIDS for, like, which I feel like it's, like, something that happens when you're 18. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to write something about something I know nothing about, but is, yeah. like, but is, you know, really important. Um, but I was, like, I was hooked by then. You know, I was like, I just have to feel that, that terrifying feeling again. Preferably not in front of, you know, not as the actor. Yeah. And Rajiv, what was that play that you saw? At um, there was a few. I mean, uh, the the one that I always kind of go back to. It was a play called Our Lady of 121st Street by Stephen Adley Girgis. Uh, it was directed by Philip Seymour Hoffman, and uh, was at the Union Square Theater. And I saw it once. Got a free ticket from NYU, and then I went back and saw it two more times. Um, and actually, Melissa, who's reading us after this, was actually in that play. She was a cast member of that play. Um, and I didn't know that till last night. We were having drinks. I was like, what? This is amazing. Uh, I saw it three times. Um, and uh, it was that play. And that, during the same season, I think it was um, Intimate Apparel by Lynn Nottage was uh, at the Roundabout Theater. And, and that also had a deep impact on me. And they were both just stories that um, I hadn't expected to see and, uh, and was deeply moved by them. Um, and... And, and continue to think about those plays a lot, and, and that just that drew me in. And it was also my classes at NYU. I, I liked, and I continue to like screenplay writing and screen and, and movies, but the, the the playwriting classes were so much more interesting to me. And like I, st I had the idea for you know this idea for my play Bengal Tiger when I was in grad school, and I was like, so I, you know this tiger at the zoo, but he talks like a man, and he, you know he, he's saying, and if and like if I had p pitched that in a screenwriting class, it would have just gone over like. You know, like nothing. Like, what are you talking about? Like, that's not. Like, how is that going to be on screen? But in a playwriting class, and it, no matter what you pitched to a class, like, I have an idea for this play. You know, most of the time, people are like, it sounds amazing. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, just like this kind of, yeah, just do it. It's yeah. crazy. It's theater. It's fun. That so. is great. Well, I want to open it up to the audience now because I have, feel like there's some, probably some questions out there. And yeah, great. All of you. 
definitely not based. Uh, well, first of all, I saw all of your works, and which I saw just by you know during this other night. And again, bravo to each and every one of you, uh, creating some quality work. And Eliza and Rajiv, I'm looking forward to seeing your works. You're going from the readings to the full production. Yeah, good luck with that. Actually, we'll see. Thanks. Um, all of you have faced creative obstacles when it came to uh, writing these works. Um, if this is possible to describe the answer, um, what was probably the most daunting challenge that you had to face while writing your play? And if possible, how did you overcome it? Did everyone hear that? So what was the most daunting challenge you had with writing your plays? And if so, how did you overcome it? Is that right? <laughs> uh, I'll start. I, so I have a day job still, um, part time. Although I think when I was writing this play, I was working 30 hours a week, so it was almost not part-time. Um, so the biggest thing is making time for me. I, I find that I'm most useful in the morning, so I had to just really force myself to get up and sit down for two hours every morning um, and work on it. Uh, but it's so easy to get swept up in your responsibilities. I also work f out of my apartment, so you know it's difficult to get something done and really focus when your cat is like sitting on your arm and <laughs> you know I like oh man there's that pile of laundry and I'm hungry and I want to I'm snacking all the time and so you know there's just the constant need to really find a way to focus. Um, that's a that's a struggle uh, that I'm always facing, <laughs> but it was about making time for yeah. me for this play. Yeah. Uh, I think mine was really because uh, it was such it came from such a personal place that I had to kind of figure out how to enter the play without having it be some sort of um, biography, you know. Uh, so I had to figure out what the lens was in a way. And I sort of decided to, instead of making the main character um, a man my age visiting his father, I made it a, a, a girl who was 13, um, just to sort of make myself be more objective about what her um, wiring was and what the play would be able to do so I would get away from it, get, get out of its way. Uh, I mean, that was true for me, too, a little bit, that the personal nature of the play often made it... Um, difficult and and also the fact that I hadn't written a play in a while was hard I, I feel like I have really I mean South it was a South Coast Commission and if it weren't a commission I don't know that it would be done you know it's and I took a long time also I know that <laughs> <laughs> it was overdue um, but I, I one of the things that's so great about their commissions here is that they don't they want the play to be good, so they're not, you know, they're not like, it's due, come on. Um, because you can't, I mean, unlike, I mean, deadlines are good, I guess, but um, for me, deadlines in TV have really been great. Like, it's like, okay, I have to finish it by Monday, so I'm going to do it. But in theater, it's like you can't, it's, you sort of can't push it. Um, so making time was hard, and then, and then also realizing that it needed to breathe, and I don't know, it was also hard. Also, morning sickness. <laughs> daunting. Um, for me, I think it was the, uh, you know, I, for me personally, like in a play, like I, no matter how serious the material might be, I think there has to be an element of humor. And that's the thing I continue to struggle with with Mr. Wolf is that it's, the, 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 the material is, is so dark and, and um, potentially kind of depressing slash, you know, lugubrious like you know like it, I, I don't want this kind of heavy-handed experience and so um, it was a challenge I the first ever first reading I had of it was about two and a half years ago at the Lark in New York City and it was a much truncated version of, of the story but I had a, like a reading for about a hundred people and at the end of it it was just like the audience was like ugh, <laughs> <laughs> like why did I have to sit through that and it's not and not even because it was badly written but just because why do I want to Weighed into this world of of just despair and uh, and I and I it, you know it concerns me still because it it is it's a really rough subject material but I think that there's that that you know to, to me that the struggle is trying to find um, you know not to say like comic relief or lightness in it but trying trying to find the the peculiarity of it that can 
that 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 can that can that can you know that have, give it some spikes where it's not just wading through this depressive material, you know. There's so much humanity in that play. Yeah, it's that you really succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It's like, <laughs> I mean, there are there are definitely moments of humor, but the hum- I think that the the humanity and the um, the ways and you know it's so interesting. And I talked to a bunch of people about it afterwards. Like, I you don't know like who to I you identify with more than one person in that play. And like mm-hmm. for me, I identified with both of those women, <laughs> and you're it's an impossible situation. And yeah. I don't know. I think that's. But it's uh, hard. That you don't it always spoke do to that, me. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. so happy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Another question there? Yes. Uh, a, correct, a question for Rajiv, but I hope uh, it can open up to the others. I'm interested in uh, the playwright and how the playwright thinks as you're writing, uh, because you created a horse in your play. Mm-hmm. Is there a part of you that thinks, how is that going to be portrayed on the stage? <laughs> yeah. How is the director going to handle that? Yeah. You just put it there and say, that's it. That's your problem. <laughs> yeah. Did everyone hear that question? It was about how do you, wh- what do you think about when you're writing, and particularly, Rajiv, the horse. What do yeah. You th- well, yeah, in, in terms of design elements, I mean, on th- there, there's a way of saying, yeah, it's your problem. But the, what that really means is that, and I, and I think this, like, this goes for me, like when I write plays, I, I'm very unspecific usually about the way a room might look, the way the set should look, the way the costume should look. I, maybe I'll have one little comment about they're wearing this or they're, you know, the desk is here. But you know, I've, I've found that designers and directors um, that I've worked with are brilliant. And they live to create you know, fascinating images on the stage in a way that I don't. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with the story and the characters. But like, um, I like to work with people who are you know, really creative and, and will take that and be like, we're going to make something wildly theatrical happen here and here's my five ideas and let's play with them and that to me is the excitement of of working in the theater is that kind of collaboration and so um i know that that i i want that moment to be very theatrical very frightening and cool and and well out of the scope of the rest of the play you know like it's we've been in a living room for the past 40 pages and now we're you know there's this beast and uh, and th- so that's interesting to me, and I I love the challenge of it, you know. And um, and there's I think there's like this playwriting festival that's called like the like writing the impossible play, like or, or you know something where like write 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 the thing that you just think couldn't happen, and uh, and someone wrote like a plane crashes, you know, and they did it. You know, like you there's a way of figuring out any kind of problem in terms of like the limitations of a stage, and that's part of the excitement of theater, I think. Stats. That's a good question. Um, Statistics. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I I don't. I mean, I never sit around being like I'm a female playwright. Yeah. I I just don't. I don't really look at. I mean, I'm aware of the stats and they are depressing, but I just think of myself as a writer and I just try to keep writing. Um, I think that's the best advice I could give is just work, work hard, um, make yourself work, yeah, and, and, and be rigorous. And put up work, too. I mean, yeah, um, I've done a lot. We yeah. probably both have. We both were in young blood, right? That's true. So, yeah, yeah it's just yeah. you have to sometimes be scrappy mm-hmm. and put your things out there by yourself or with your friends. <coughs> um, and that's so rewarding, too. Yeah, I mean, my advice always to any writer is to keep writing. Yeah. And I got that, my um, one of my professors in college was Donald Margulies, and he was an, a, an incredible teacher, and um, I wrote a play for him. I wrote my first play, that's the play that still is sent to, to, my, to television shows as, like, my sample. Um, and it's a pretty good play, I think. Um, and I... Uh, and I was really impressed with myself. It was like the first good play I had written. And, uh, and I was like, Donald, who might play? You know? And he was like, it's really good. Now write another. You know? He was like, stop congratulating yourself. Yeah. You know? And you learn from 
you learn from that. I mean, I don't know specifically in terms of like being a woman in the theater. To me, and I know, I mean, I know that that gap exists, and it certainly isn't um, something to be trivialized. Uh, but I, I have felt that in the theater, at least, being a woman has been much less of a detriment to me than in other aspects of the entertainment world. So um, I think that, you know, write yeah. your best work and then write another. Write another. <laughs> yeah. And, and make it too. I think you know making opportunities for yourself is a um, is an important part of that. Yeah. Just for anyone who didn't hear that question, what is the value of being in an environment like this as writers around other playwrights? And to me, this is the best part of being a playwright. Um, or, you know, this and, you know, and doing it play, like the, when it's not lonely, you know, when it's yeah. not, you know, and I, I do like writing alone in my room, but like, um, even, I think I like this even more than like going into like rehearsals for a play, like, because there's a stress there that is different. Like, I, I love these events. There's a, there's a few of them. This is, maybe the best one, you know, like that all these people from all over the country can come here and hang out and we see plays, we see like three plays in a day, you talk about it, you go drinking, the, you know, and there's just, there's connections that are made, friendships that are made, um, you learn from other people, you learn from the work you see, and it's, and there, and there is no, like to me there's not so much stress, I mean I was nervous yesterday before my reading, but like, you know, it's, 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 um, it's, a, it's a warm audience and it's, uh, and it's, you know, I came here two years ago and, and met, like, 20 people that I still am friends with now. And I met people this weekend. And uh, it's just, it's great fun. It's like, the, to me, it's like the, the icing on the cake is, is something like this. Adam, do you have any? Yeah, I think in uh, my first time I went to something like this was 1996 at the National Playwrights Conference. And I was, like, 26 or something. And I was really, I had no idea what it was to be a playwright. And they put you in the center of the experience. And you get a dramaturg and a cast and a director. And they... Every week they work on one other play, and it's basically a, su a summer camp of making theater. And you meet all these New York actors, and you meet all these really important writers. And I was there my first year with Lee Blessing and Thomas Gibbons and a, a number of amazing people. And at the end of the summer, I just remember being like, oh, I have to come back here. You know, so I wrote another play literally to try to get back into that. <laughs> literally to try to get back into that place, because we also, like, had so much fun and we played wiffle ball and got drunk and skinny dipped, you know, so there was tons of reasons to, but I, I realized that it was, um, th these things kind of are like uh, this enormous shot of B12, you know, for, uh, you, you, you hang out with your community, you make friends, I met Rajiv this weekend, um, there, uh, uh, Eliza as well, all of, well, all of us, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, there, you meet people, I, it's the first time I had a great conversation with Teresa Rebeck last night. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's really really cool. And then you know we we rush back to our little caves and we write and then we get lonely. And then if I'm lucky because I direct my work, so I get to be with actors in a room a lot, and that that sort of solves my loneliness disease. But um, these things are so important, and uh, it's, it got to be the point where like when I didn't get in the s second or third time. I hated the place, you know, <laughs> because I was like, how do I, and it just became all about trying to get back into the O'Neill. So I think <laughs> these, these things are really important and that they should be, um, should continue for another long period of time. Rachel, Oh, it's just nice to feel less alone. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I feel like sometimes I'm sitting dealing with my play and I'm worried about I don't know. Like, for instance, there's a character in my play who's a war vet, and that was a scary thing for me to write. And it's nice to, you know, talk to other writers who are having a similar moment of fear, and you realize, oh, I'm not the only yeah. person dealing with this thing that I'm afraid to write. Um, that's important. That moment in your play is electric. Okay. I love that. That his when he comes on the stage, it's like so dangerous and scary and Thanks. fun and funny and scary. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if a play is good until I can be with other people, too. You know, I just, it's, it, it, there's so much, for me, there's like so much fear and doubt in the writing process. Um, and, you know, it's an exercise every day in trying to like shut, shut that up. Um, and so it's just nice to be, to hear it and to be with people. And really, I mean, I got to work with um, one of my best friends as my director and um, we haven't worked together since we put up our very first play as young women in New York um, <laughs> who nobody was giving an opportunity to so we made our own and um, Lila my director it's just like it was just so it's just so nice to be in a room with her and like the, so all the directors and the actors and the other writers it's just it's wonderful it's fun well we're going to end on the word wonderful <laughs> and thank you guys so much